welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews. I'm Judith and you're watching another episode of Overbooked, the series where I talk about every single book on my shelves because I don't think I would have ever finished this series otherwise. Today we are talking about the Nine Realms series, which obviously starts with A Queen in Hiding. <laughs> Some quick disclaimers before we start. This is a review copy of book one of this series and the rest of them, the other three I read on Scribd. Nobody is paying me to talk about books. I'm not being sponsored by Scribd. I wish. And all opinions are of course my own. I am also going to keep this as spoiler free as humanly possible, though we are going to be talking about the general trajectory of this series. If you would like to go into this knowing absolutely nothing, click away now. I will also link the story graph below if you would like to find any content warnings. I think the biggest one I would bring up is there is some violence against women in this series that you might want to consider. <laughs> that you might want to consider? That sounds like it's an option. It's not super pervasive in the series, it's just something that's there. The Nine Realms series was published in 2020 as a bit of a, I think, experiment. I'm not sure what their, their full reasoning was, but the idea was that they would publish this four book series across four months, it making it the ultimate fantasy for fantasy fans, binge an entire series in four months. We'll come on to whether that was maybe successful or unsuccessful, but did you hear about these books? If the answer is no, I'm gonna say unsuccessful. Obviously 2020 was a weird year. This book actually published in January of 2020, so right at the start of the pandemic when things were getting a bit difficult. Sarah Kosloff, the author, comes from a background in film, teaching about film specifically, and wrote this series after realising that a lot of classic fantasy does not pass the Bechdel test. So she wanted to write a story where instead of we're waiting for the return of the king, they were waiting for the return of the queen. I think those two things, that cinematic element and that I wanted to write a book with more women in it, gives you probably quite a lot you will need to know about this series. Okay, normally I try and read the blurb, but I've given myself the challenge of um, just explain the plot. In fact, what I've written in my notes is just explain the plot, you can do it. So thank you, me. As I say, this is a four book series. We have, I'll put the covers up, A Queen in Hiding, The Queen of Raiders, A Broken Queen, and The Cerulean Queen. And in book one, A Queen in Hiding, uh, we start off with uh, an assassination attempt on Cerulea, the daughter of Queen Cressa. Uh, in this matriarchal, there's always a queen and the queen always has a specific magical power. They do not know what Cerulea's is. They cannot identify it. Does she have no powers? We don't know. And as such, Cressa sends her daughter into hiding. Uh, and Cressa's power is to influence people's minds. So she convinces the people that Cerulea is with that she's not the princess. She is in fact just a ward. You need to dye her blue hair because a big thing in this world is that people of different areas have different colored hair is how they differentiate them. It's by the by, we'll come on to it in a bit. They have to dye her cerulean blue hair. And the subsequent books are, as you might expect, about the wait for that queen to return to the throne and a lot of other stuff going on. There's a lot of conflict and different things going on between the nine realms. So we follow multiple different plot threads across the four books from different people, different stories from huge, big, we rule this country stories down to we are just some people trying to get by stories. And they all intersect across this big, big narrative. Very cinematic, very, very cinematic in its structure. And one thing I really liked about the series is that big, vast plot structure with a lot of different threads to follow. It never felt like too many. It wasn't like Game of Thrones where you're like, I, we haven't talked to that character in 500 pages. What, what are they doing right now? They definitely all intersected a lot more. And I think it helps that there are very various touch points and connections between the characters that you discover as you go. Uh, there are some characters who you get much less of or who kind of get forgotten a little bit at times, but it certainly didn't feel annoying to me in that way. Uh, and I really enjoyed the option to follow different plots. And I didn't find that there was one person that I didn't care about, which is what often happens is I'll be like, no, I only care about when I read Song of Ice and Fire, I only care about Arya. Why are you telling me about anyone else? And I would just skim all the chapters between her perspectives. I didn't find that with this. I really felt like there were a lot of different people doing interesting things. They wanted them all to succeed. And then it was fun to see different characters meet up and where they cross paths and putting things together in your head as to like, oh, that person's going there and this person's trying to get there. I wonder if they'll meet and then they do. Oh, it's very exciting. My other pro, this is a minor spoiler. It does come in right at the start of book one. I don't think it will ruin the book series for you, but they do discover Cerulea's power is talking to animals. And I'm obsessed with this. It's so good. I love books where you can talk to animals. I love books with talking animals. I love talking animal powers. Oh, it's so good. Um, and in this case, you get a lot of dogs, which as you will know, I love. It's one of the reasons I love Robin Hobb so much. She writes dogs really wonderfully. Uh, but in this, you have full conversations. There are heaps of different animals that Cerulea talks to and uses in different ways. And it's a really respectful relationship with animals, which I appreciated. 
if you want a book where someone can talk to animals, this is a really good series for that. It's very satisfying. Speaking of satisfying, I think that the arcs of each book are very satisfying. I read these uh, one every week for about four weeks or so-ish, I think. I can't quite remember. You could go back and check my What I'm Reading Now videos. Um, I found that each book did manage to be fairly self-contained, though you can tell it's been written to be read in one fell swoop. I found that you managed to have a bit of a rest at the end of each one, so you could put this series down, it would be fine, but you wouldn't get the satisfaction of the ending. It's interesting where book three ends and book four begins, I wouldn't necessarily have predicted that, but it, it does make for satisfying reading. The stories are good and chunked out in a really sensible way. It doesn't feel like one enormous book chopped into four, it's one enormous narrative chopped into four with good breaking points. On to my cons. Um, it is a little bit long-winded. I think this first book is about 500, 500 pages or so, 400 and, 471 um, to the end of like the appendixes, appendices, I should say. And I think I wouldn't give any of it up. I wouldn't take out a storyline. I wouldn't lose a chunk. I just think there are some things that could probably happen maybe a little bit faster. Uh, there's a lot of travel in this book. There's a lot of we need to get from one place to another. I think probably book three more than any of them. Book three, yeah, no, book three more than any of them has some slower points because you kind of have to do a lot of the getting characters ready for book four. Some people really enjoy that more long-winded approach at fantasy. Uh, some people prefer something to be much more fast-paced and just easy to get through. I don't think this is difficult to get through, but it is long. I found that I was really struggling with book one particularly. I think book one is frustratingly probably the worst of all four of them, uh, just because there's a lot of setup in book one that isn't really essential and you could probably put it in a prologue, but it's good to have once you've read all of them because it's nice to look back on. Hard to say. It's a little bit generic, like it's not doing anything particularly groundbreaking on you. Do we need everything to be doing everything particularly groundbreaking on you? No. And I think if you wanted a fairly generic fantasy story that did feature women in positions of power and having conversations with each other and being interesting in different ways and choosing different life paths, which I think is what Sarah Kozlov was trying to do, this will give you that. Uh, it is not trying to be a groundbreaking fantasy. It is trying to hearken to those like cinematic big fantasy series uh, and putting women in them and just trying to do something interesting. That's not to say this is all women, there are male characters as well doing great stuff and queer characters as well. Like that's why it felt like something very familiar and yet it didn't do a lot of the things that those familiar fantasy stories do where you have to be like, oh, let's just pretend it didn't have no female characters. This did, it was good, but it's, it's not doing anything particularly new. If you were very burned out on fantasy, this would not be a series I would pick up. The other thing I'd add is I'm not sure about some of the world building and that plays into some of that genericness. Like this idea of having different hair colors, it's mainly just there because Cerulea has to dye her hair all sorts of different colors to get through in the world. Uh, and every moment is quite stressful because anytime she's out and out for a bit, she has to find somebody who can dye her hair for her. It's a little bit weird. I don't, I don't, again, it's not doing anything new. It's not, I don't believe it was harmful in any way. I don't think it was bad world building at all. Uh, just some of the things I was like, this feels a little bit silly. <laughs> in comparison, some other things this felt familiar like to me. Um, I read all of the King Fountain series on Amazon, Kindle Unlimited stuff uh, a few years ago. It must've been 2017. I binge read them and I loved them. Sidebar, binge reading is a difficult word. I know some people don't know how to use it. I tend to say like to devour a series. It's complicated. We don't eat books by the by. Um, but that series has very similar like familiar fantasy, lots of different characters who follow a thread, very satisfying ending. You kind of know where it's going before it's got there. Um, so that reminded me of that. I don't recommend that series very often because I'm not a huge fan of like the clean writing movement, reading movement. I, the sex isn't dirty, like that's not. Um, but I have read them and enjoyed them and this had a, a sense of that. So if you've liked those books, you might like these. In some ways, uh, this did remind me of Robin Hobb. We have the talking animals, we have the many characters, different things coming together across four books, uh, big epic fantasy moments, uh, but kind of instilled in small individuals in that story. That's slightly Hobb-esque. I don't think that the writing is similar. I don't think this is as emotionally devastating as Hobb was. But that doesn't mean that there aren't similarities. I suspect if I'd read more epic fantasy stuff, I'd have more recommendations. But my list of this kind of story that I have read is very, very slim. I basically saw the Lord of the Rings trilogy at one point and was like, that's everything I need. 
um, and never read anything else. So if you have epic fantasy recommendations, plonk them down in the description below. I would love to read them. I wasn't planning on reading past book one until I started making this series and I realised that I didn't want to make just a review video for the first book in a series that is designed to be read all in one go uh, and I wanted to try it and see what it was like. I don't actually think that marketing style paid off uh, and that can be blamed on the pandemic or on just how reading was going at the start of 2020. I don't know anyone who picked up all four of these books in four months, though I did read them in one month, so maybe I am the exception. I don't, I don't know. Um, I do think that it works as a series to have completed and to read all in one go, but I think it might have been on more people's radar if it had come out one every six months or something. I don't know, it's interesting. Would I recommend that people read it? I think it was enjoyable. I think it was a good time. Like, I had a good time reading it. It is long, but if you're not a person who needs to squeeze in like 20 books every month, you'd be totally fine just sitting and reading these. I think they'd make great holiday books. I would have really liked to read them on holiday. Maybe I would have just liked to be on holiday. I don't know. There's so much really good fantasy that's doing different things that if you were looking for something like snazzy and new, this wouldn't be what I recommended. But if someone said, I just love fantasy books and animals, this might be on the list of things I would recommend. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully I have helped you discern whether you would in fact like to read all four of these. As I say, they are on Scribd. I'm not sponsored, but I will leave a link to Scribd and you can get a free trial and read them if you're interested. I've asked you already for epic fantasy recommendations. So while you're leaving those down in the comments below, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. It makes me feel loved and appreciated. You can follow me on social media, come hang out on Discord where we have a wonderful time talking about books. If you would like to join my patrons over on Patreon who support me and the channel and make me feel incredibly loved and appreciated, that's all down there as well. That's all from me, and I will see you in the next one. It's gonna be some bloopers now. In fact, what I've written in my notes is, just explain the plot. <laughs> this wouldn't be what I... <laughs>